to the truth in this art i am your host the rob lee yes i've had the rob lee which is a drink here for for my guests who i'll i'll hold off until we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later but uh today i have the privilege of being in conversation with an illustrator based out of massachusetts with a focus on horror and game art please welcome nick tofani welcome to the podcast Hey, thanks for having me, Rob. Uh, what a delight. <laughs> <laughs> that great. That's great. All right, see ya. See ya. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> yeah, you had um, me in, now I'm gone. <laughs> so just for context, so there's a drink um, named after me in Baltimore, and mm-hmm. I just went to the restaurant that serves it before doing this podcast. And uh, when I go there, it's like, are you having one of you? And I was like, hold up. And I thought about it. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm having a Rob Lee. It's delicious. It's vermouth and, and uh, bourbon. It's delicious. That's incredible. Well, how did you get a drink named after you? I know this isn't the point of the podcast, but I got to know. I mean, I mean, I'm friends with the owner. so. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that, that's still super cool. Could you imagine <laughs> if the drink was bad, though? <laughs> like, oh, that was just his way of being like, I actually don't like you, Rob. <laughs> I, we absolutely test kitchen at first. He was like, how is it? I was like, it's good. I'm proud to have my name on it. And oh, yeah. for, for, for context... I had a um, I had a guest who did an interview, and he was like, "I went to that restaurant and I had the Rob Lee." He's like, "Are you that Rob Lee?" I was like, "I am." I was like, "You had my drink. You've tasted me." <laughs> yeah. There Out of go. context, very strange thing to say to somebody. <laughs> I, I like to do that though. I like to keep it weird. Um, yeah. No. Hell yeah. <laughs> so so as we as we get started here again, thank you for coming on to the podcast and. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and indulging me because it's it's gonna get weird. Um, but before we get oh, before good. we get too too deep into it, share share your story. Like ultimately, like how did you you know start and you know where does the story start? What sort of creative things did you do as a young person? And I have a few other questions related to that. But let's start off with some of that sort of introductory stuff. I mean, I, I guess it really just started with uh, me. One of the first movies I remember seeing as a kid, literally the first movie I remember seeing as a kid, was Child's Play 2. Not the first one, the second one. Because <laughs> my, my uncle like just put it on, and we was, it was like on the TV. And it had commercial breaks, because I remember very vividly seeing Chucky like stalking through a door, and they're like, we'll, we'll be right back to Child's Play 2. And then it was like a commercial for Pop-Tarts. And just being like, ah, Pop-Tarts are terrifying. <laughs> And for a long time, I was just like terrified of dolls and mannequins and things like that. But like, it, it was like such a weird feeling to be scared. And I, but it was like fun almost. So like, I started seeking that stuff out. And you, you remember, I mean, everyone knows like scary stories to tell in the dark, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, my cousin would like steal those books from the library when I would like try to find them. So like, I never had them and he'd have them at his house. So I just read them there. And I remember those illustrations just like really standing out to me. And uh, just it was just so unnerving and weird and like no real organization to it. And I loved it so much just because like there's so much that you don't see on the page. But like your mind starts wondering, like, what's going on here? What's the whole story here? Like, I know there's stories that go with the illustrations, but a lot of those illustrations are just like their own sort of thing, even without the story. And it's just like that's what I love about horror and uh, storytelling in general is just like uh what's left up to the imagination you know yeah yeah i um i mean he he's deprecated and he's he's terrible or canceled or whatever but i remember this sort of comment around um from james franco when he did that uh documentary interior leather bar and he was like yeah he did a movie cruising in 1980 and it was like yeah we're not going to show any of this sort of like gay leather culture stuff or what have you and we're going to cut all of this out. And he's like, this is weird. He's like, I'm going to do a documentary showing what I think happens in here because you guys cut it out. And it is wildly explicit and wildly like, oh, this is just the inside of a bar. But he's like, I'm theater of the mind. This is what I think is ha- happens in between these points we see in the movie. This yeah. is frame, like a companion piece to the serial killer and his leather community or what have you. Yeah. And I think that there's something there. And I, I was having a conversation uh, recently and I was talking about really being immersed when you come across, let's say what um, I remember watching American, uh, what is it? American crime story about OJ. 
Mm -hmm. And then watching the 30 for 30 about OJ and kind of filling in those different gaps. And I Mm -hmm. watch things like that. And then I get, you know, white rabbit going down the rabbit hole, filling in (laughs) all of those things to get the full story. You just have like a cork board behind you with all the little pinpoints and red string. You're like, did OJ really do it? (laughs) 100%. 100%. It's like he did it and he scored a touchdown afterwards because he's terrible. (laughs) But, but yeah, you know, in, in kind of filling in those sorts of sorts of things. And that's that's the way I think consuming something works. And also Child's Play 2, I think that's the one. I don't know if it's that's not the one where he, when he says, you heard me, bitch. And it's so funny. That is that is the one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. And like uh, it ends with them in like the doll factory, which is like one of the best like set pieces or set whatever for any horror movie conclusion ever just a bunch of chuckies all over the wall and then they like kill him like eight times <laughs> it's insane yeah. it's so so talk about and, I, and I, I remember like you know watching a lot of horror movies as a kid i think um mm-hmm. mines was usually like definitely the slasher so you know freddie jason that, that kind of stuff or what have you um and mm-hmm. we may have a we may have a horror question later in this rapid fire portion of the pod oh good. So, so what got you into like illustration and talk about like some of the, your, your education, schooling skills, what have you, that kind of helped you go into this path of the work that you're doing? Uh, so like I said, like horror movies, things like that for a long time, I didn't draw horror, uh, because mm-hmm. I thought I would be like judged for it or like people would look at me weird, but they already looked at me weird. So like at a certain point, it just kind of broke in my brain. I'm just like, or more of a breakthrough where I was just like, eh, who cares? I'll just do it. Cause I enjoy it. You know? Uh, but I, I loved, uh, just illustration in general, like the stinky cheese man, Lane Smith, his work, uh, Edward Gorey, like the, just all, uh, uh Tommy DiApollo, who's like a Massachusetts guy. He was a big one. Uh, he had that one story about like an old lady who made some spaghetti and it flooded the town. <laughs> and even, even this one book that's like required learning in Massachusetts, I kid you not. Uh, well, it seemed like it, it was like a children's illustrated book about the great molasses spill. And on the cover is just like a child drowning in molasses. And like, we're, we're playing it off. Like it's this fun, whimsical thing that happened in Boston when like eight people died. <laughs> But yeah, so so just like drawing pictures and watching cartoons, things like that uh, was really big for me. And I mean, everything I have is basically self-taught. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, like most artists, majority of artists, I would say I pull inspiration from basically everywhere. Uh, and, you know, if I see something new I want to try, I'll try it out. And if I like it, I'll keep doing it. And, you know, repetition makes practice makes perfect uh but (laughs) i just i mean i just love drawing i i always have and it's only until recently like within the last like a little before the pandemic where i was just like i'm gonna just draw what i want to draw and not worry what people think and not be so like critical of myself and that's when i actually got like a lot better at it and i enjoyed a lot more not to be like oh i'm good at drawing but like i'm okay (laughs) (laughs) and i have a lot more fun with it now I'll, I'll say that, and, and thank you, thank you for sharing that, because I think it's something about doing it for yourself, and if people like it, that's when you're finding your tribe and the people that dig it, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's it's a thing where I see people's stuff, and maybe coming from this sort of spot of, I'm not an art critic, I'm not, you know, I'm not, not doing that, I'm a person that likes what I like, and mm-hmm. really being resolute in that, um, you know, it was a few pieces that really stuck out to me when I, I saw you at the small press expo, that's where we initially met for for the folks listening, um, that I got a lot of Junji Ito vibes. And I was just like, is, is this intentional? This guy absolutely has to have. And I know I was watching a lot of Junji Ito collection, to, but I was like, nah, we got to talk. <laughs> uh, well, I, I do love Junji Ito. Uh, and I recently, uh, they Crunchyroll, or I think it's Crunchyroll, they do like this, or Viz, Viz, the manga publishing company, they do like a series of videos with Junji Ito where he reviews like horror comic stuff or like horror art. And he reviewed one of my things and he really liked it, it seemed like. And I was like, this is the coolest thing that could ever happen. Like, this is the, <laughs> this is the pinnacle. There's nowhere else but down from here. Uh, but it was so cool. Uh, and, but, I've loved Junjito for a long time. Like, I don't want to be hipstery. Like, I, I liked Junjito before it was cool. But, like, <laughs> I do I do remember when I, like, back in, like, 2011, just first finding his stuff and being, like, obsessed with it and just, like, going down the rabbit hole of all of his comics and, like, seeing 
just the body horror that he does. That's my favorite type of horror, by the way. Body horror, the best. It's so good. It's just visceral. It's freaky. It's like, could this happen to me sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, that, I'm, I'm updating my question as I go along now. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. So what is what would you say if 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 someone came to you and said what is the one drawing that represents you like within your portfolio what would be that one drawing that if this was your your real this is the one piece you're submitting what would that piece be and why of your work um i would say for me the one that i really like the most uh and i want to like represent me um it's this piece i did where it's just like a face with its head tilt back and the eyes looking forward and just kind of like a grimace on its face and it just kind of looks like it's sort of like drifting apart uh and i think uh, i titled it i've seen the worst of it it's just it's very uh i don't know i it's 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 just like the way i drew the expression just like happened on accident but like i love how it looks and it just it freaks me out when i look at it sometimes and i don't know it just it's just very i i say it represents me the best because it's just like there's a lot of pain in those eyes <laughs> i say as i laugh <laughs> um, yeah but i don't know i i really like that one but um outside of that i guess anything that's like just a uh, freaky little ghost <laughs> I like those. That, that might be the name, I, of the, the name of the podcast, Freaky Little Ghosts. <laughs> Freaky Little Ghosts with, with your host, Rob and Nick. <laughs> hey, the new podcast spin off. We got it. We're there. Just, just a monochromatic Casper. Yeah. Oh, my God. I saw, uh, I, sorry to go off topic or whatever, but like I saw, like, there's, there, uh, so my girlfriend was having a uh, presentation for her thesis, like an art school thing. And one of the people in her class, uh was talking about spooky buddies like in depth the movie spooky buddies which like no one's ever seen spooky buddies what the hell is that and then like she just like like i don't know what it had to do with her art or her thesis or anything it just like but she started showing pictures of like this casper body dog it was just like casper's body with a dog's head superimposed on it and that was like the plot of spooky buddies and i don't know why it just made me think of that and it was awful <laughs> i literally just typed in spooky buddies now i'm gonna end up watching it later because you know the OG harlan williams is in it and i gotta make that happen oh okay well, yeah you gotta watch it if harlan williams is in it i didn't know that they didn't mention that at all on their thesis what the hell can't, can't forget the great harlan williams um, no you can't what are you talking about so you, you said you're earlier you said you're drawing inspiration from like like everywhere and i i i think a lot of you know a lot of a lot of stuff that i do is very similar where you know, I might draw inspiration for a question. I have like a kind of a solid spot that I get stuff from, but when that's not quite firing, it's like if I'm walking around and, you know, in Baltimore where I'm based, I'm going to get something out of that. Or even at the small Brex expo, I'm going to get something out of that. It's going to inform how I go about questions and trying to get into the head of a guest. Right. So talk to me about, you know, how do you approach brainstorming and conceptualizing your ideas for illustrations? Like, you know, talk about that process a bit. Um, I guess just like going throughout my day and when I have like, I, I struggle with anxiety. I, I'm medicated for it. I go to therapy. I do all the work, you know, do the work, folks. Anyway, uh, but like just anything that sort of like freaks me out or stands out or just seems a little off is always just like a place for inspiration, like just driving down the road late at night by yourself in like a wooded area it can be freaky and then you're just thinking about like those old urban legends about like the person in the back seat and like the high beams on and i i was obsessed with urban legends when i was younger i mean i still kind of am but like i would i would research them in depth but uh things like that just like any little thing that like seems kind of uh innocuous but then like when you really let your imagination start to run really freaks you out that's where i find most of my inspiration from just like little everyday things that somehow devolve into being these terrifying experiences just because like you're letting your imagination run wild mm -hmm. yeah yeah the uh anxiety that sort of stuff is, is, is kind of an interesting motivator like um it can make you do things you didn't think you'd do it's like mm -hmm. oh yeah Ah, I guess I'm gonna lose this weight out of fear, or get on that get on that bike, <laughs> or whatever it is, right? And but definitely yeah. on occasion, I, I run into some of the urban legends, and some you just can't get away from. Uh, 
I, I don't know if it was the, actually the movie Urban Legend or not, or maybe it was a snippet from one of those like old sort of uh, maybe creep show type of flicks. It was one that I remember that's like, hey, lady, can I get a ride? It's like she hit a dude. It was creep show. That bugs me out. I, I can't yeah. deal with it. Or because I, I live alone, right? So if I go home, I'm like, if I watch something that's a little too like, nah, it's a little too on the nose. I don't want to wake up to a hammer to the face. Let me check the crib. Yeah, I, I think that was Creep Show too, where she hits the homeless guy with her car, and then like yeah. he's just dragging along the roof and everything. I love Creep Show too, if only for the one segment where they go out on the raft and there's like the oh thing in the gosh. water, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it just like one of the most painful looking scenes ever of that person getting split in half and just dragged down into the raft is like. It stuck with me. It's 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 rough, and I I watch a lot of horror. Like I definitely Ooh. have uh, Shutter, you know, yeah. and um, just watching what was it the one hundred and one greatest scares or what have you, and being able to revisit. There was a few things when I hadn't seen. So like watching the uh, what is it the autopsy of Jane Doe. I was like, this is fire. I like this. I like this a lot. Oh, yeah. And I'd never seen it before. And I was like, God, why did I miss this? I was like, this is a cast that I jam with. And, you know, and it got me to thinking, like, how did they classify some of these things? What's a scene? What's a scare? Like, the ring, that scene that they use for the ring is not necessarily the scariest scene. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I get it. You know, I get that they, they maybe voted on it or something. Yeah. So in terms of maybe how you go about classifying your work and categorizing your work. What is the thought that goes into that? Like I try to, in doing this, I'm very hesitant to say, Oh, this is a Q and a, or this is an interview by I think for the audience. It's like, this is an interview with this person. How do you go about categorizing and, and classifying your work? Um, uncomfortable. <laughs> unless like it, it's weird uh it, it's weird it's like a lot of the stuff i draw now that i'm thinking about it uh it kind of has like the same running theme of just like strangers staring at you or eyes just watching you and i'm just like is that like a subconscious thing that i'm doing now that i'm realizing it uh and like when i'm not doing those like it I'll, I'll draw stuff like that when I'm like in a good mood, like just like freaky, like people staring at you sort of thing. Cause it's always in the back of my mind. And then when I'm like depressed, I start drawing really stupid meme drawings, like just like redoing Renaissance paintings as damn shoddy. Okay's. Uh, but like, it, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's weird how I just like bounce between that, but yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, just the feeling of anxiety and the terror of anxiety and the unknown and just a uh, uh, theater of the mind sort of thing. Um, but I, I noticed that, like, with the pandemic and how everything's been, uh, at least before the pandemic, horror movies were pretty scarce. And, like, they would come out every now and then. And there'd be, like, there was a period of, like, really bad, like, B-grade slasher movies coming out. Like, the I Know What You Did last summer sort of movies, all that. There was, like, a bunch of those. But nothing really outside of that realm. And then years later, we have the pandemic and, like, Hereditary comes out. And then, like, Elevated Horror becomes, like, a thing. People love that. And it seems like because everyone's been home alone and forced into introspection, uh, it's made people really gravitate towards horror more. And that's why we're seeing so much more of it now than we ever have. Just because, like, people are looking for something else to be scared of than their own thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's very true. And, you know, one of the things that uh, you, you, you met my partner, like, her ki- her kids his girlfriend uh she's like she's one of those i don't get afraid from it i'm afraid by by anything horror movies don't scare me at all so we've been on this thing for the last few months so we're gonna find something we're gonna find something that scares you and mm-hmm. we learned that oh she doesn't sleep i say oh you don't really sleep so that's that's what the issue is go to sleep and just like oh, everything is afraid <laughs> everything terrifies me we're gonna find something. <laughs> oh my brain's working now oh no <laughs> but yeah it's you know, it's, it's certain things that because I do this thing of going back and looking at like maybe where the root of things come from. So uh, a couple months ago, I ended up watching uh, Deliverance for the first time, mm-hmm. and I was like, eh, ding, you know, ding, 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 right. ding. And I was like, oh, it's a fifty-year-old movie. It's like it's fine. I'm not really. But then you know, I remember even going a little bit further back and watching. I think I've never seen the original Exorcist. Right. But I think I've seen Exorcist 3 for some reason. Oh, that's the best one, so that's fine. That's the best one. 
So, you know, it's kind of like one of those things. And then seeing like people have like a discourse around like movies that just didn't really hit the mark, especially like sort of these horror movies, like mm-hmm. that first remake continuation of Halloween, the, the Danny McBride, whatever. Yeah, they, that was fine. But the last two sucked, especially Halloween ends stunk. Mm. Yeah. And I was just like, what, what is this? And I feel like I'm able to have more, I think to your point about more people having an interest in that genre, I'm able to have more discourse in it versus people saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I, oh God, you're going to make me go off on a tangent about those Halloween movies. But like, I kind of like, first off with the third one, if they had just made that like a through line through the movies of that kid, whatever, becoming, you know, the next Michael Myers. Spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen the bad movie yet. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, the and, and then, like, for some reason, it's like years later, Michael Myers walks away. No one follows him. Years later, Jamie Lee Curtis's daughter's dead. And she's just like, eh, I'm fine. I gave up on my whole, like, vengeance thing. I don't really care anymore. It's like, oh, because your daughter got murdered? You'd think that would be the thing that would, like, make her want to fucking go after Michael Myers. <laughs> this is literally what I said watching the movie. I was like, oh, just going to make pies now. Okay, cool. Yeah, because it turns out the problem she had was with her daughter, not Michael Myers. <laughs> And ever, when Judy Greer died, she's like, all right, whatever, we'll move on. Yeah, well, got rid of her. Good, good. Yeah, all right, cool. Man, don't, don't need to worry about that anymore. But it's just, it's so stupid. Oh, my God. I just, like, there was no real, like, cohesion between the movies. It just felt like someone else directed each one, even though I know that's not the case. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, was, that's bad. That, yeah, that's, that's the thing. And I think you know, you, you want to see more of it and you want to see more of sort of this media around that, those sorts of themes, that sort of genre, if you will, of yep. this can be scary or what have you, because you looking back, books used to be scary. Now books aren't scary enough. So we need to make books scary again. You know what the problem is the internet, the internet exists. Mm-hmm. And so like everyone's yeah. exposed to everything now. So we're all, we're all going to get those scares of like random things every now and then. And then we build up a tolerance for it. And then there's nothing that surprises us anymore. And then that's why it feels like every, th- every news cycle is 24 hours at most because like mm-hmm. something big happens and then we just forget about it the next day. Cause we just like, there, there's just too much happening all the time because we have too much access to information. And that's why we're not scared of stuff anymore. How do you feel that that has affected the internet, right? Has affected um, illustration, has affected like your work, whether positive or negative. Cause I know now we have this sort of AI stuff and artists are getting, you know, kind of squeezed out. And I know that they're doing audio AI. So that's also infringing in this sort of area as well. That's an issue um, mm-hmm. that I don't, I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts around and how has like the Internet is sort of technology in that space kind of impacted your work? Um, well, it hasn't impacted me personally, uh, because, I mean, I think AI would break if it tried to copy what I do just because it's so messy uh, <laughs> and it wouldn't be able to make that sort of a mess uh, unless it was organic. But um when it comes to like other illustrator friends of mine who have like much more cleaner professional like line work and it's really good i i see like the ai just it runs their stuff through it and it basically just tries to make a one-for-one copy except for the hands for some reason are always fucked up and i don't like that's terrifying right there just like the idea of a person (laughs) just looking completely normal and then just having these like fucking ai hands is just kind of terrifying in itself um But yeah, no, I I mean, like, there is, like, the fear that it's going to take jobs from people because the problem is, like, corporations and, like, people who hire artists for big jobs don't really care about art. They just care about, you know, making the bottom line and attracting customers. And if they can do that with something that costs way less for them, then they're going to do that. But as soon as they start doing that, they're just going to charge more for AI and it's just going to be the same shit all over again. But I don't know. I'm not scared of it. I just think it's garbage. And I don't like that it steals people's work in order to make itself work. You know, that's not art. It's and and it doesn't extend nothing. Nothing is innovating there. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that kind of kind of gets me as well. I'm on the same page with you where, you know, we talk about things that are scary, right? You know, it's really scary. Black mirror is scary because we see it every day. We like, this feels like something from Black Mirror like three or four years ago, especially with the whole voice thing. Like, um, you know, you, you'd have the fanboys, man, 
James Earl Jones is retiring. Don't worry. We have enough of his dialogue to make Darth Vader for the rest of eternity. Oh, my and God. <sighs> that literally is an episode. I think the Dom Hall Gleason episode of Black Mirror, when he dies, they make a robot of him. It's like, oh, yeah, I have enough of his dialogue. I can just have a conversation with you. Yeah. that That is unnerving. <laughs> Remember when people were like freaked out when Tupac got a hologram made of him and now we have like full CGI deep fakes of people and it's just like yep. it's it's yep. insane. Like the and this technology and people putting their faces into AI photo generators don't realize that their information's being taken and like that shit can be used. Not like any of us are important enough yet that that would be a problem but like it's like it, the fact that it's out there is very uncomfortable and very unnerving that someone has access to that and they can just use it for whatever means they need yeah identity it's, fraud is going to go to the next level that's all yeah, it is and we, we've seen more and more of that during the during the pandemic because you know i think it's two things as you were touching on with you know people want to be afraid or want to have that distraction i think mm -hmm. it, it's, it's closer to where it's at whether it's Oh, this is something to make you laugh. Ha ha ha. You know, filters on the face or what have you and something to terrify you. But really, they're all distractions and it's all to get you to engage with whatever it is. And I don't know about you, but I got that filter on my phone now that says no calls that I don't recognize because I've gotten so many sketchy calls. And it's just like there was a leak. There was a hack. And I think you're right where it's more and more your identity, you know, from a social security number, I suppose, perspective is just like vulnerable, but your creative, potentially your creative identity mm -hmm. is, you know, people are picking at it. How can I like do this? Um, I was, I like puns, right? And my partner was joking. She was like, you know, they have the Wu-Tang Clan name gener generator. They should have a pun generator of your nonsense. So I was like, <laughs> look, don't get me started. I'll write an algorithm, damn it. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like people would absolutely use that. That'd be great. They would use that to make like D and D character names. Why not? <laughs> I, I had, um, I'm going at comic, um, about uh, cat lawyers and, um, I have a character that I'm talking about in there. I think he, I want him to be from the sanitation department in New Jersey and I want him to be called the trash pandas. Oh, that's I, good. I, I, I think that works really well, but they're going to be yeah. like mob guys. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, so, absolutely. So uh, this is a very interesting question for me. Um, mm. Describe your version of the artist lifestyle. Like, what does that co context mean to you? Like that idea? Well, um, the ideal version of the artist lifestyle, I imagine, would be to just do art your entire life and make a living wage and, you know, be creative and have outlets for that and make work you can be proud of constantly. Uh, but what it really is, is just like a lot of <laughs> so, a lot of just like uh, trial and error and trying to make it work and having to have a full time job just so, you know, you can make those ends meet and you can have insurance and you can, you know, survive uh, because starving artists used to be a term that was thrown around back in the day. But it wasn't like really a thing because like, you know, artists couldn't make enough to survive because they would just scrape they would scrape by but nowadays you know as an artist unless you're really making the big money from like corporations and stuff you are literally going to be starving uh unless you have like a job as well uh and that's that's what's tough about it so like any free time that you have is most likely going to be dedicated to doing art and thinking about art and wanting to get better at art but then you kind of fall into this cycle of like oh, i wish i could be doing art right now but then like as soon as you're doing too much art or art that you don't want to be doing for like a client or something like a project you don't care for then you're like oh i hate this i don't like art anymore <laughs> and that's it that's why it sucks because everything's commercialized here in the old usa uh and capitalism really does uh kind of have a rope around the artist's neck so to speak um but and now they're just ready to replace us with this artificial intelligence stuff but hopefully the more people call it out and make fun of it the uh the less people are less likely to use it you know but who knows i just feel like this chapter of the story is called rise of the art pots <laughs> so i think i think that's actually a good point to uh, go into this next question mm -hmm. um Aside from money, because I think money is, is too easy as far as like what, what do artists need, what are three things that artists need and, and why do they need them? And I think that 
connects very closely to what you were just talking about there. No need versus want. What artists want is validation, for sure. A lot of artists, majority of artists, I, I even if they don't want to admit it, some of them, uh, they just want validation. They want attention. They want to be like known for their work, whatever. Um, it, it, you know, that's just the truth of it. But as soon as you stop seeking that and you start having fun with it, because that's why you've gotten to art in the first place, hopefully, uh, you know, you find more success with it. And you find that audience, like you were saying earlier, uh, you find your tribe. Um, but I guess uh, what artists need is a tribe, you know, people like minded artists to bounce ideas off of or just like have that sense of community because you can't just do it alone or you're just going to be miserable. Um, they need housing. <laughs> they need to be able to live somewhere. They need to be comfortable. Uh, and um, a love for their work, you know, they need to be able to enjoy what they do and uh, be able to maybe not like everything they make, but enjoy the process, you know, yeah. because it's, you know, it's like that old saying, uh, the real old saying, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, you know, yeah. or it's about the journey, not destination. And that's what it is with art, you know, uh, it's about the process and not so much the final piece. And that's how art collectors really um, make out uh, their whole spiel of why a painting with some splots on it should be five million dollars or whatever <laughs> because it's, it's about the death it's it's about the journey getting there and not the actual piece itself and yep. i think that can be translated to like smaller stuff like just drawing a face or something you know just finding like a new way to make a line and just being like something lights up in your brain and you're like oh this this rules like i want to do more of this i know why i like yep. art again yeah but yeah basically that yeah, I, and I, I think the the part that definitely sticks out, and I agree with you, I think the part that, that sticks out is that, that sort of place, um, just having a place, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that lends, leans into the capacity to create. If you're so f fixed on, how am I going to afford my studio fees? How am I going to afford my living conditions and all of that? Then you're taking a barista job that's going to take you away from or whatever right whatever yeah no there's there's no shame in any sort of job i mean like no. unless you know your job is killing puppies or something then there's shame in that but like <laughs> but even then you know you got you gotta pay the bills um gotta uh, make a living. <laughs> gotta make a living it's a living uh but yeah no, it's, I, it's, it's flintstones reference anyway uh uh I don't it, it, it's tough because it's like you want to be able to live off your art but realistically especially nowadays with how many people are doing art and how many people it's very competitive you don't want it to be competitive because art art's uh, about freedom of expression and being yourself and when it becomes a competition in your mind and like you're competing against other people then you lose what's fun about it and like you know you're not doing art for the sake of art you're doing it for the sake of success and i think and if you yeah, if if you do it for you know the enjoyment of it, then maybe the success will follow. You know? And everybody's everybody's different too. Like you know, I find that I could try to rip off your style and do that, but that's you. That is your style. That you yeah. know, even and that's where it goes back to the the whole AI thing. Like nothing new is being generated. It's already taking for something that exists, and mm -hmm. they're not Roy Lichtenstein in it. They're not doing that. They're you know, it's something that that's different. It's something that is. It's kind of the thing that happens in music a little bit. I think, you know, Frank Ocean was talking about it in the song about like, you know, it's artificial. You know, you have this pitch correction. You have all of these things. I want the rough edges. I mm -hmm. want the, you know, you listen to a song, you hear the live version and somehow that you like that version more than the album version. Yeah. There's feeling, there's rawness in it. There's and, soul in it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And with AI art, there's no soul there. It's a machine. It's ones and zeros. I didn't ask yep. for those. Yeah, I didn't ask for ones and zeros. I'm not a math person. I'm an art person. Get out of here. Yeah. So <laughs> lastly, this is the last real question I got for you. Um, sure. And, 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 and again, this all ties. I think this is the kind of perfect culmination, crescendo, if you will, of this portion. What advice would you give for someone that's considering pursuing a career? in art and illustration in horror specifically uh what, what advice would you give them don't worry so much about what everyone else thinks and you know just do what scares you or makes you happy you know uh and just uh chase that sort of feeling of, that you had when you first got into art and you know if you're just getting in it for the accolades 
maybe art's not for you. <laughs> just just have fun with it. Just have fun, and you know you'll find your people, and that's what matters. I love yeah. that. I, I agree with that. Yeah, All thanks. right. So you know what time it is. It's time for the rapid fire portion. Oh. So rapid fire. You know how this this whole thing goes. Um, they're just quick questions. Don't overthink them. Okay. Uh, they're fun questions though. All okay, right. great. All right, so here's the first one. Um, describe your art style in three words. Uh, spooky, scary, creepy. <laughs> thank you. Sounds like you're describing Booberry, but thank you. <laughs> I am. I'm. I'm actually describing Count Chocula. <laughs> it works. It works. It's yeah. very good. It's very good. Yeah. Uh, this is the one I updated. What are your top three body horror movies? Oh, okay. Uh, the thing. The Blob remake from 1988, I believe, yep. and uh, Society. <laughs> I, I've seen all of those. Society is ridiculous. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, there's probably a better option there, but that was the first thing I thought of when I thought of body horror. So. For a second, I thought you were going to say Suspiria. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, I would give it to Suspiria, because the oh. ending of the remake there is insane. Um <laughs> I don't want to go out on a limb or anything. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rim shot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so most of your stuff I've, I've seen is um, kind of monochromatic, right? Mostly black and white. Um, yeah. If you were to incorporate a color into your work, what color would it be? Uh, red. A lot I, of I red. Can, I can already know why. I already know why. Yeah, yeah cause yeah, because bulls hate it. Because <laughs> lipstick. <laughs> Because lipstick, and I, I want people to want to kiss it. <laughs> Red is the color of romance. <laughs> and tomatoes, because people throw them at you. Yeah, <laughs> and they go, boo. <laughs> boo my answer. Here, here's the, uh, so I got, I, got, I got two more. Um, sure. So, so Massachusetts, right? Mm -hmm. What is your quintessential Massachusetts food? Fish. Like, just like fish and chips. We do a lot of that here. I know they do that out in Seattle and stuff, too. And, like, Baltimore has, like, a lot of good seafood as well. But, uh, yeah, no, we, we've got good fish and chips later. Good potatoes. A lot of Irish people out here. <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> ah, a lot of potatoes. That's fine. That's ah, fine. <laughs> There's the last one. Um, if you can... Uh... That's great. If you can turn any object in your room, so where you're currently at, into a character, what would it be and what would his personality be like? Uh, it's going to be this cup with bat wings, because uh, that's the first thing I saw. Um, or it's going to be uh, it's going to be this little grimace and it's going to turn into the grimace <laughs> and he's going to want to steal all your milkshakes. I don't know, just like a just a little little bat wing guy who just goes, man, I'm not this is my new character that I'm that I'm workshopping right here right now. His name is Aegit Blah. <laughs> he says Aegit Blah. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's yep. ridiculous. That's really funny. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So that's that's pretty much it um you know I, I think we got it i think we got it all covered um Brad. so what i what i would like to do is um two things i'd like to thank you for being on this podcast Ooh, thank you for having me lots of lots of giggles from from my end and uh two i want to invite and encourage you to uh tell the folks where they can check you out social media website all of that good stuff floor yeah is yours Cool. Uh, so my Instagram handle is at Nickel Doodler. That's N-I-C-K-E-L Doodler, D-O-O-D-L-E-R. I wanted Nickel Doodle because I'm Nickel Doodle and everything else. But the lady who has that runs like a like she posts like a picture of food every five months. And I asked her if I could have it. I would pay her money for it. And she said no and didn't say anything else. <laughs> and uh yeah, uh, Nickel Doodle on everything else. Uh, you can also find me at uh, www.nickeldoodle.com. That's my, a lot of my work is on there. So there you go. It's not a fancy website, but it is a portfolio. Uh, yeah, that's really it. Um, and also, if you close your eyes and think of me, you can find me there in your heart. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. So I want to again thank uh, Nick Cafani for coming on to the podcast. Nickel Doodle, Nickel Doodle, Nickel Doodle. Nickel do I'm like Beetlejuice. Now I have to leave. <laughs> I won't say it five times because then you'll pop up in the mirror and it's like, damn it, I'm dead. Oh no, and then I got a hook for a hand and a cool for here's my question. 
Before we go, I know we're ending this, but I really got this is something that's always bugged me. Why does Candyman have that sick coat? Like that's nothing to do with his backstory. He just has this sick ass fur coat for no reason. He went thrifting. <laughs> that, yeah, that, like he he died in like the fucking like before fur jackets were even a thing, I imagine. And they're just like, what if we made Candyman? I don't know, look like a pimp. That would be sick. <laughs> sick. I thought I knew you were going to say a pimp, by the way, which is really funny. <laughs> and we were all thinking it. Like, Helen. He's like, oh! <laughs> Helen, where's my money? <laughs> He's just like, one yeah. of the other. You get one of the other. Like, <laughs> the hook's doing it too somehow. <laughs> that's really funny. That's, that's great. Yeah. So, again, I want to thank you for being on this podcast. And I'm Rob Lee saying it is art, culture, any, in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for it. Yeah.